Welcome back, Boneheads, and welcome to everyone joining me here for the first time. I'm Ryan Howard. As gamers, we've become very familiar with a set roster of character classes that we typically choose from when we're playing fantasy role-playing games. Everyone knows what I'm talking about here. The fighter, the rogue, the cleric, the magic user. Some people include the ranger, the paladin, the druid, maybe even the sorcerer or the warlock if you're an absolute heathen. But have we ever stopped to think about why these classes have become so ubiquitous in our fantasy role-playing game? I'm going to be spending the next few videos discussing the essential fantasy classes, their histories, and how they progress through the game. Before I do that, though, I, I really feel that it's important to nail down a definition of class. It's going to be important when discussing the classes that belong and the classes that I feel don't necessarily belong in the game. So in this video, I will be laying out my criteria for classes, what constitutes a class, and how that definition of class impacts the game and a character's progression through the game. Now before we get started, remember to like, share, and subscribe. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, that's the best way to help me continue doing it. Now, let's discuss my definition of fantasy classes. So right off the bat, let's define a class. To me, a class is a specific role in-game taken on by each player. It represents the skills that a character is trained in and the profession that they are recognized as having. I feel like every class has to have a clear path of progression that takes players from itinerant adventurers all the way up to positions of power, influence, and responsibility within the game world. And lastly, I feel that a class must be broad enough to encompass multiple different playstyles but also specific enough to ensure that no class has major overlap with another in their responsibilities and skills. Every class has a specific part to play as part of the team. In fact, they'll usually have multiple specific roles for each aspect of the game. As an example, a wizard can cast spells, but he's also highly educated, usually multilingual, and generally knowledgeable on all things historical and arcane due to his intelligence bonuses. A fighter is obviously a skilled combatant, but they're also the only class that traditionally is able to attain nobility, which opens up the doors of power to not just the fighter himself, but the other members of the party. A thief is generally nimble, skilled, and silver-tongued, uh, but they also have combat utility with their backstab and sneak attack abilities. While class abilities are generally weighted more towards one aspect of play than the others, there should never be a moment where a class feels like it's completely useless in a given situation. Never give your players the opportunity to zone out and stack their dice in front of them. Every class has some kind of utility in every given situation. Now, it's important to emphasize that classes' roles should be specific and not usurp one another. It's really bad when you have one class that's able to do something another class should do better than they do it, but I'll come back to that topic a little bit later. Every class is a trained profession. It has defined skills, it requires instruction by a master, and it has a series of associated duties that any reasonable person would expect a member of that profession to be able to perform. To the first point, players will have to study their skills under some kind of master or even a sanctioning body or organization. There might be some kind of magical college that a wizard will have to study. Rangers might have to go to some kind of ranger conclave. Druids will have to find an archdruid. You guys get the point. Now, along with this training comes the expectation that you'll be able to perform the duties expected of that profession. You know, rangers, again, to use them as an example, are expected to be able to guide people through the wilderness, hunt monsters, you know. Clerics are expected to help the poor and heal the sick and do all that kind of stuff. Now, why do I bring up the demand for these skills as kind of a proof of concept for each class? Well, that's because the profession would only exist if there was a demand for that profession. You have to take into account some kind of market for the skills that your players are armed with. 
Market's not always going to be legitimate. You know, magic users and thieves in particular will probably find a lot of the demand for their skills is going to be under the table, not exactly above board. It ultimately comes down to an issue of supply and demand. There's always a demand for the skills that your characters have. Otherwise, there wouldn't be anyone around to train them in a particular profession. Now, sometimes the demand is very small or the supply of masters is very small, which can lead to kind of, you know, interesting niches that characters can explore. A good example of this would be the druid. There's probably a lot of demand for what druids can do. They, you know, bring rain and help crops grow and things like that. But there's not ever usually a supply of arch druids to, you know, train a large amount of druids. Druids are always presented as pretty rare. So... Sometimes the demand will be very high and the supply will be very low. And in that case, players may find themselves, you know, constantly courted for their abilities. Another good example of this would be the paladin. Paladins are generally very few and far between. It takes a lot of righteousness to be a paladin. So if a player is, you know, ultimately ending up playing a paladin they're probably going to see a lot of demand for their skills, a lot of people begging for their help. And that can lead to some very interesting adventures and interesting situations, especially for a paladin who, by their very definition, is not allowed to turn down a request for help. Now, without turning this into some kind of lecture on economics, I do also want to mention that along with the demand for your player's skills will come some kind of incentive some kind of uh, price that your player can ask or some kind of reward that they will receive for doing these various tasks. Now, oftentimes this is a financial incentive. You know, there's no easier way to get players to do things than to wave gold in their face, especially certain types of players. Uh, however, the incentive is not always financial. Sometimes it's deontological, meaning duty-based. The paladin, like we mentioned in the previous example, it is a good example of someone whose incentive is deontological. Their power depends on them helping people who need help. A cleric is another example of this. They're bound by their god's law to essentially further their god's will and help people, especially if their god is a good-aligned god. Now, other times the incentive will be prestige-based. So this would be, you know, the players doing something to curry favor for a faction or, you know, the fighter seeking to earn his noble title through gallantry in combat or the thief seeking to impress his masters at the Thieves Guild. The incentive is often financial, but not always. And if you can find players who are willing to play around with incentives that aren't directly financial, you can really get yourself into some interesting situations with your roleplay. Another important aspect of each class being a recognized profession in your world is that their profession will have a certain reputation amongst the general public. Everyone has thoughts on what your characters do, and that can make their lives easier or far more difficult. You know, for example, knights and warriors are expected to be chivalrous. Thieves are expected to be, you know, backstabbers and criminals. Clerics are expected to be upright and, you know, helping the needy and all that good stuff. The interesting thing about reputation, though, is that it will change from society to society. So while the general populace, you know, your, your rank-and-file citizenry, might have one opinion of your players' classes, in a different circle, they might have a different opinion. Say, for example... The cleric is very popular amongst the general public, but the nobility aren't particularly fans of that religion. That kind of thing can happen all the time, especially with thieves, where, you know, maybe the, again, the nobles will have a negative opinion of the thief, but the general public will see them as some kind of folk hero, or the thieves' guild will see them as particularly skilled and, you know, particularly admirable because they're so good at their thieving. The further you progress in your profession, the more prestige you'll earn amongst your peers. Your reputation will grow in other circles too, and your enemies will also begin to uh, change their thoughts on you. Uh, they'll start to take you a little bit more seriously the more power that you gain. 
So, uh, you know, your bounty on your wanted posters will go up or they'll start sending more soldiers to uh, sniff out your location. That's the thing about reputation. It's a double-edged sword. It's good and it's bad. And you can't have a good reputation amongst all aspects. There are very few people who have a generally good reputation. It's pretty much, you know, The Rock and The Rock. That's about it. The best progression path for fantasy RPG characters is what Alexander McCreese calls the Adventurer Conqueror King progression. Players will ideally, in this situation, go from low level wandering and survival to high level intrigue and large scale war. Every class gains not just skills but responsibilities as they level. Remember earlier when I said that every class has associated duties and responsibilities with it? Well, those duties and responsibilities will change as you increase in your skill. At first level, you'll still be pretty reliant on your early mentor to help you get better, but by 10th level, you'll probably have students of your own in whatever class you end up pursuing. Now, progression from the ground level into higher levels of skill in the real world requires lots of training and practice, so why should we expect anything differently from our fantasy RPGs? In the past, RPGs have included some levels of training. A lot of wizards have to learn spells from other wizards. Rule Cyclopedia had a great section on weapon mastery and having to train with specific masters to get better at using weapons. Uh, I feel that this should be something that we continue to do and, and something that is required for all classes. Because not only does this explain leveling up in a way that kind of makes sense to our brains, but it also requires PCs to be somewhat congenial with other uh, NPCs. So your, your wizard is going to have to ingratiate themselves with other wizards in order to learn more powerful spells. Uh, thieves will have to become part of a thieves guild and work with other thieves to, you know, again, improve their skills and move up in the world. Clerics will have to be uh, congenial with the other clergy in their religion. Fighters will need to be part of some kind of organization, be it a mercenary band or a regular army, where they can move up in rank. Basically, it's roleplay buy-in for every single class. You want to move up, you want to get better at what you do, you have to be friendly with other NPCs. Character progression should represent not just a growth in existing skill, but an expansion of skills and a fundamental change in what it means to be a member of a certain class or profession. The fighter is kind of the easiest example of this, where in the axe progression, you go from being kind of an itinerant warrior to a commander to eventually a noble, or even a king, depending on how you like to play your game. Uh, but this is a fundamental change. Once you reach a certain point, it is no longer becoming of a fighter to be delving in dungeons, especially not with land and title. At a certain point, your role becomes a little bit more managerial with some hands-on aspects once you actually enter battle. So what I mean by this is your primary responsibility is not delving in dungeons anymore, but taking care of your subjects and your men at arms. And then once you have an opponent to fight or you end up encountering someone who wants to take what you have, then you enter the fray again. But this is a fundamental shift in not just your class, but the way that the game is played. And every class needs to have some kind of reflection of this. One of the reasons why a lot of people jump off of high-level play is everything starts to feel samey, and that's because RPGs are designed so that the game shifts every once in a while. A level 20 character should not be doing the same thing that a level 1 character is doing. Even if you scale up all the challenges to meet the level 20 power level, it's still going to feel like you're doing the same thing you've been doing the whole time. The only way to make campaigns last for, you know, years and years on end is to change things as the players progress. So that's where this Adventurer Conqueror King progression comes in. And while I gave credit to Alex McCreese for this, 
it's actually even older than his axe game. This goes all the way back to really the beginnings of Dungeons and Dragons as a whole. This is the way the game was originally intended to play, and this is how classes should be progressing throughout the game. Every class needs to be broad enough that different players can play the class in different ways, but specific enough that it keeps players' roles distinct from one another. As an example, a wizard can be focused on collecting magical knowledge, amassing sheer raw power, or going as far down the magical rabbit hole as they possibly can, even to the point of madness. However, they should never be able to wear heavy armor, command soldiers, or fight with great weapons. That's the domain of the fighter, who likewise should never be able to cast a spell. Each class should represent a specific role or function and should be the best at performing that function. The fighters are the best at combat. Thieves are the most nimble. Wizards are the most intelligent and the only people who can cast arcane magic. Any overlap should be minor and it should have a significantly different flavor to it. So, as an example, the ranger and the fighter, they're both martial. Both of them have combat roles, but the ranger is more focused on ranged fighting with their longbow or skirmishing with kind of lighter weapons. They're not going to be a frontliner the way that a standard fighter would be. Now, while classes need to be specific, they shouldn't be too narrowly defined. Because the more narrowly you define a class, the less freedom of play you give to your players. As an example, I love Castles and Crusades. I know a lot of you who watch my stuff also love Castles and Crusades, but I don't like that they separate the thief and the assassin from each other. Those could easily be contained within the same class, which you could call either rogue or thief, and it would still be just fine. They just focus on different aspects, with the assassin being far more focused on killing people and disguising themselves, and the thief being more focused on skill and nimbleness. Matter of fact, they generally share the same skills, even you know beyond Castles and Crusades. In other editions where these two roles are split, they generally have the same set of skills, just with more focus in one direction or the other. However, I feel like they should still just be contained in one class, with the differences being down to how each player plays their character. This is one of the reasons why modern subclasses are so frustrating to me. They are subdividing and codifying things that don't really need to be subdivided out, and generally, subclasses, especially in 5th edition, end up usurping other roles. The ranger is a good example of this. The ranger in 5e is completely usurped by the rogue scout, which is completely infuriating to me because not only does the scout get a whole bunch of things that rangers should get but don't, they also have all of their rogue abilities too, including expertise. So when you have a scout rogue in the party, all you're left with as the ranger is essentially a half-assed fighter and a quarter-assed druid. And that's not fun for anybody. So there you have it. That's my definition of class, and this will be the launching point for my series on classes, which I'll continue to call Classes Explained. So I'm going to be starting out with the fighter, magic user, cleric, and thief, which are the core classes in my opinion. If there could only be four fantasy classes, those would be the four that I would choose. After I wrap up those four, I'll be moving on to the Paladin, Ranger, Bard, and Druid, who are a little bit more specialized, but I still feel like need to have their own classes because their roles are so unique. Then I'll be talking about, you know, the Barbarian or the Intuitive Caster classes, classes that I feel like are a little redundant or don't actually need to be in the game at all. Well, let me know what you guys think. Just, you know, leave a comment and tell me your uh, thoughts on my definition, or, uh, you know, tell me if there's anything specific you want me to cover in the class videos that I'll be doing. Until next time, I hope you guys will join me, and whether you rolled a 1 or a 20, I'm so glad that you rolled your bones with me, Ryan Howard, and I will see you all in the next video.